Welcome to Class 4 of Restored Gospels Teaching Series, What Does the Book of Mormon Teach? Today's class continues the discussion on the opposition in all things. Amen. Well, I'm loving January. You know why? Five Sundays this month, so look at where we are. All right, we're continuing on with this opposition in all things that we began last week, and I'm not going to review much although we'll get some review over the course of time. I want to um, I'm going to try to throw a few things at you, and I'm always guilty of maybe cramming a little too much in the time we have. Um, we're still on 1 Nephi 1, 1. We talked about the language of the uh, Egyptians, and now we're focusing in on this learning of the Jews. And notice this. We threw out the word parallelism. I'm not getting into it yet, but it's going to be coming up here very soon. But notice right in the very first two verses of the Book of Mormon, you get this nice little chiasm with the very center of it being consists of the learning of the Jews. Now, why is this important? The, everything we're discussing here today and in previous weeks and weeks to come focuses on things the Jews understood. And Jews are the ones who wrote this or descendants of the Jews wrote these records we have. And it's important to understand how they thought. It's also important to understand how they spoke. And we find evidence of all these learnings throughout the Book of Mormon. So a little bit more on that kind of stuff later. So opposition. We came up with this idea from Scripture last week that there is an opposition in all things. And if you just read the Scripture by itself, you think, well, is this just a lesson in physics or something? You know, gravity, Newton's laws. It's more than that. And it's this basis that Lehi teaches his children. And so now I'm going to throw something out at you, scripture students here. Who says this? Uh, Choose you this day who you will serve. You remember from scripture who, who made that famous statement? Anybody? Joshua, Joshua right. Joshua. Well, it's interesting because where I'm quoting from is not the book of Joshua just yet, but it's actually Alma. And Alma includes this statement. Now, why does he include this statement? Chooses you this day who you'll serve. This is just like the scripture about the opposition in all things. If you don't read it in context, you don't realize what Lehi taught his children is that if there isn't an opposition, we, righteousness cannot occur. His words. Well, why does, why does Le, or Alma say this? Um, Choose you this day who you'll serve. Going back to the book of Joshua, here's the context. The Israelites have just crossed over into the promised land. Moses stayed behind. He takes them and he's challenging them. He said, listen, when you were in Egypt, there were those gods. He said, now you're in this land of idol worshipers, these Amorites. They have their gods. He said this, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods of your fathers, served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. There is the statement. Whether it be the gods of your fathers, served on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, famous statement, we will serve the Lord. Now, why, what does that have to do with anything? Why is that included in opposition? Joshua is saying this. You've got a choice. And he says, no one is dictating your choice. So what Alma, therefore, says is in this context. Alma's recounting how this man named Korihor came into their land preaching against Christ. And he says this, he was antichrist. He began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. Now, there was no law against a man's belief. For it was strictly contrary to the commandments of God that there should be a law which should bring men onto equal, unequal grounds. Unequal grounds. What does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with Joshua? See, what Alma is teaching is the learning of the Jews that's evident way back in the, even in the days of Moses that while they had laws upon laws dictating what they had to do, there were no laws dictating what they or we must believe. Now there's a big difference. You see, what, what Alma goes on to teach, 
This is where his scripture is, by the way, that we just read. He's building up in Alma 16, verse 8, saying there's no laws uh, to put us on unequal ground regarding belief. He said, so therefore, this is why the scripture says, choose you this day who you will serve. In other words, Alma is explaining what Joshua meant when he was speaking to all of Israel, saying, make a choice. But you're not, there's no law dictating your choice. Isn't that interesting? See, he goes on to say this, if a man desired to serve God, it was his privilege. It's our privilege as well. Or rather, if he believed in God, it was his privilege to serve him. But if he did not believe in him, there was no law to punish him. Now, people could take Joseph Smith's writings and they say, oh yeah, he made up this stuff in the 1800s. And he, you know, early America, everyone was talking about freedom and liberty. And so this is just the Constitution rewritten. No, it's not. He's, he's explaining what Joshua had written. And now maybe the founders understood that principle. I, I don't know. But notice what Alma goes on to say. But if he murdered, he was punished unto death. If he robbed, he was also punished. And if he stole, he was also punished. And if he committed adultery, he was punished. And yea, for this wickedness, they were punished. For there was a law that men should be judged according to their crimes, right? According to their works. Nevertheless, there's no law against a man's belief at any point in time in God's design. Now, why? Why? That's the question. And why are we talking about this in terms of opposition in all things? There seems to be a disconnect. But, but notice this. A man was punished in Alma's day only according to the outward acts that you had done. Now, I'm not suggesting that anything you think there's no law against. Beliefs are your principles, the things that motivate you, the things that you, you move toward. Um, thoughts are something that come into judgment. Uh, uh, we won't really discuss that as far as a class topic right now. But the point is that God from the beginning set up an opposition, but God from the beginning never made a law dictating our beliefs. And that's an important, it's an important point that the Book of Mormon teaches. I never knew this. In my, most of my life, I, I, wish, I wish Nephi had been, my, or, or Lehi had been my kid's grandfather, so he could have taught these things, because I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I want people to understand, my kids, everyone, that what the Book of Mormon is teaching is foundational principle that can govern your life for good, and it lets you know the pitfalls of the consequences. You see, we're free to make a choice, but we're never free to choose the consequence of our choice. And, and this is where God, in, in the beautiful, plain and simple terms, sets this up from the beginning, from the beginning of the Book of Mormon, from the beginning of time. And, and I wish I had understood these things. So Joshua's teaching agency, we use that word, but it's more, I think, I think it's bigger than the word agency that we use. The word agency doesn't occur in the Book of Mormon, per se, but the concept of it is, is grander, and it's, it's being explained by Lehi right here. So these problems, God, God doesn't make laws that force you to choose, but God gives you a heart that can choose. And, and this is the only way the atonement can be applied. So I wish I had understood this, and for this reason, if for nothing else. I wish I had understood this opposition in all things so that I would stop complaining to God every time I encountered something bad or opposing in my life so, so that I could have been more able to see the bigger picture, the 30,000-foot view. You see, what my nature is is when a bad thing happens, I want to start questioning, well, where is God in this, right? God must have abandoned me, or what did I do to anger him that this bad thing came upon me? Um, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe God, and maybe Lehi specifically, was arming his children with knowledge so they would be prepared to see through to the good still when bad things happen. You know, we don't get the count in the Book of Mormon, but Lehi... and dies before all these wars happen, but he foretells, Nephi sees his brothers would be a scourge unto them in the time to come. Lehi even sees in vision his people wiped out in generations to come. You know, if I had had that vision and seen, hey, my family's going to be wiped out in generations to come, I would just want to quit. You know, I would just be so devastated by that, right? 
And, and yet, they saw through this. Le Nephi writes how, you know, he says, hey, it's been 30 years. We've already had wars with my, my brothers and their children and grandchildren. And we've made swords and fought. And, and yet, he, it doesn't discourage him. I would think, every, for me anyhow, if I had been sent to this promised land and all of a sudden my family's wanting to kill me, it's like, I would just be wanting to hide in a cave somewhere because I would think, I didn't understand God, right? But he's giving us and he's arming us with knowledge. He's arming us with principles that are important for us to understand. So um, continuing on, this is what they were all teaching. This is this opposition. Now, notice where um, Alma continues. There was no law against a man's belief. It was strictly contrary to the commandments of God that there should be a law which would bring men on unequal grounds. And then he says it again, and it's just the crimes which he had done. But the summary of life then is no laws against belief, temper our belief to understand that we're always in the middle of opposition. So coming back, and these scriptures, or these slides rather, I'm sorry, they're just notes of mine, and I know there's a lot of information, and I'm kind of skipping over. The reason they're presented this way is so that if someone wants to go back on and study this online, we have it on YouTube now, whatever, you can get all these notes and scriptures. But this is kind of where it's more in my notes versus a presentation, okay? So notice this, Lehi continues to teach his son Jacob. And remember, his son is only, he's over eight maybe, but not much over eight. He's speaking to Jacob, the one born in the wilderness. And he starts out saying, hey, you've been born in affliction. You've seen affliction already in your days. And I'm summarizing the, the verses in this uh, second chapter of First Nephi, in verse 60, 61. It said, in my childhood you have suffered afflictions and much sorrow, because of the rudeness of your brothers. Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, you know the greatness of God, and he will consecrate your afflictions for your gain. So we already get this parallel idea that his afflictions are somehow going to be balanced with gain or goodness, anyhow. So when he's talking about the rudeness of his brothers, though he continues and he says, your soul will be blessed. You will dwell safely with thy brother Nephi, and all the days shall be spent in the service of thy God. So what happens from here is he continues to describe this. And if we have time today, and again, we're, we're short on time, I'd like to go through more of this chapter and, and just read it together because of the parallels. But if not, I've got some on slides and I'll, it'll be a study you can go back to later. I'll, I'll present more of a condensed summary of Lehi's uh, message to his son, Jacob. But, but what he concludes with, and back to the slide on the overhead, wherefore... Men are free according to the flesh. All things are given which are expedient to men. Free to do what? Choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, Jesus, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. He lays out the fundamental principle here in the early part of the Book of Mormon. And this is a parallel. The whole Book of Mormon is based on parallel ideas, parallel words, uh, that are meant so we understand with clarity God's word. Our freedom is given in the midst of opposition, but there always exists an opposition. Our choice is to be choosing to the left or to the right. Now, Moroni sums up his writings by saying, take heed that you do not judge that which is evil to be of God or that which is good and of God to be of the devil. It's given to you to judge that you can know good from evil, and the way to judge is plain that you know with perfect knowledge as the daylight is from the dark. The concepts of all the writers of the Book of Mormon are that our choice is a free choice, never forced, but in the way is easy, generally. It's even built within us to know how to judge. Now notice this, and what I just said, you think, ah, it's built into everyone. Look at Moroni 7.14. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man. The Spirit of Christ is given to every man. It didn't say the Spirit of Christ is given to every person who's baptized and receives the Holy Ghost and attends Colburn or whatever. The Spirit of Christ is given to every man that they might know good from evil. So what does that mean? You know, it's differentiating, I believe, from the gift of the Holy Ghost, for instance. The Spirit of Christ given to every man means that God's we, we would have no life if God's life wasn't in us, if his spirit wasn't in us to some degree, which when you look at the definition of salvation, it's to be fully returned to God, and the definition of damnation is to be fully separated from God. So in this life, because by default we have life, by definition, God's spirit 
which breathed into Adam and breathed life into all living creatures resides in us somehow, somehow, whether we acknowledge him or not, agnostic, um, atheist, whatever. For what reason? So we can know good from evil, right? Humans can be jaded after time and be calloused towards evil, but the, the differentiation to know good from evil is something God said is built in with those who have the capability to understand, of course. So in this life with this opposition, this fits perfectly into the Hebrew way of thinking. This learning of the Jews was that things were one. Remember, heaven and earth, it stated all things that in them is, because to the Hebrews, heaven and earth weren't two separate entities, two separate creations, they they were one. The heaven was the masculine, the earth was the feminine, just like the man and woman coming together in marriage and being one. That's why it states all things that in them is singular. A lot of things, and there's a short list here, nighttime and daylight, you know, the evening and the morning were the first day, according to Genesis. That's why Jews to this day begin celebrating the Sabbath on the evening of Friday, because it was an evening in the morning. Darkness occurred, but light penetrates the darkness, but the darkness and the light together are, are one. Time was one eternal round. Um, this whole creation in human existence, this is an interesting one. When you look at how the earth was created, God did everything, and there was a lot of things done in parallel. For instance, he forms the oceans, then later he forms the fish in the life in the oceans. That it says he filled the seas. In the Hebrew, I've, I've learned, it says that word really was fattened, in other words, enlarged or gave life to. And it's an interesting word that didn't translate by the translators to the appropriate understanding of the Hebrews. But in all these things, he, he makes the sky and then he puts the birds in the sky. He, he, he creates this like palette, and then he fills it with life, the skies, the earth, the water. But after all this creation is in balance of, of the things that he creates and the things that he fattens them with, then he makes man. And, and, and the Hebrews looked at this two ways, I've learned. Or really, as one, one, one thing. There was the entire universe and all the creation and all the life that went into it. And then there was man that was made in his image to occupy it. And those two become one. But, but that, was, that was the sum of creation. Everything and then us made in his image. And so... Um, Coming back to this, there's no law against our belief. Some of these scriptures are a little out of order. Remember this, uh, or these verses here. Remember, Lehi teaches his son, there's a parallel even going back to the forbidden fruit and the tree of life. They were in the garden. Why? The scripture teaches this, and this is all from Lehi's teaching. Wherefore, God gave unto man that he should act for himself, wherefore he could not act for himself, save it should be that he were enticed by the one or the other. Now, remember this opposition, all things. This is the same chapter, right? And so he's saying there had to be an enticement. There had to be something where we could choose one or the other. You see, Adam and Eve's state was described as limbo. They didn't really know happiness. They didn't know despair. They didn't know joy. They didn't know salvation. They weren't going to have children. It was probably pretty there where they were at, but that was it. That was it. God's purpose in teaching about the opposition, he said, without the opposition, you can't be enticed. And without the enticement, you can't choose. And without choosing, you can't be like the God who created us to choose good over evil. And I'm not saying God was confronted with that choice. But that's, that's what it means to be made in his image, to be able to choose and, and not be just a function of, a function of the life we, we live here, like a, like a dog or, or you know, some, something that just lives out of instinct. You know, I remember one time walking our dog when we lived in the country, and she had gone and grabbed a squirrel, and, you know, the squirrel was gone just like that, but proud of the squirrel. She's carrying the squirrel in her mouth down the road, and then all of a sudden, you know, you'd think she'd be happy because she had a squirrel. Well, there was another squirrel, and she dropped the one she had, and she went and got that one, too, and it's like, weren't you happy with the squirrel you have? Well, the point is that she's just a dog, right? And that's how dogs are, and and she'd get all the squirrels in the room if she could, because that's just what dogs do, but... See, we have this choice, and we can, recon- we can um, you know, we're able to do the things that God can do in terms of create and think and, and make rational choices, which the rest of the, the existence doesn't. So, 
So it was important that we were able to be enticed because without that enticement, this return to God isn't possible. So some of the parallels Lehi teaches, and again, because of time, I'm, I'm going to not read the whole chapter uh, today. Maybe we'll come back and read some of the verses. But these are some of the things that Lehi is teaching. He's teaching, hey, your afflictions can be countered by gains, but you'll have afflictions. We'll have afflictions, and we don't want any of them. None of us want the afflictions we're dealing with. He talks about the temporal law of Moses that would be fulfilled by Jesus. He talks about the, temp- the spiritual laws that were broken by humanity that Jesus would intercede for, all these things balanced. He talks about a punishment affixed and the happiness affixed. Now, this word affixed is interesting because it's one of these ones that um, it doesn't occur in the Bible, in English translations, the word affixed, but it's got a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word, um, I've actually got about six slides that, again, I probably won't even bring up right now, but it goes through the Hebrew derivation. It exists several times in the Book of Mormon, but, but this word was like hatham, I think, in the Hebrew. And it's the same word to seal. So it's the same word in Isaiah 29 when it talked about a sealed book, something that was firmly uh, fastened, right? That's the origin. And this word affixed, while it doesn't occur in the Bible, is, is the better word that's used in the Book of Mormon, where he says, by this opposition and by this life, he said, there is a happiness affixed and there is a punishment affixed. Now, these scriptures are really good. I wish I, I, wish I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now and just kind of cruising through it and summarizing them. But um, I'm going to just continue on because there's a couple of things I do want to make sure I cover today. So the death in parallel with the resurrection, the opposition uh, in parallel with the righteousness. The, he talks about the justice of God in parallel with the mercy of God. Now, so this opposition being required is so that we could be free and that we could make choices. Now, I want to share something, and this is going to just take me a second to get switched over. I did this last time, and maybe um, maybe this will work less. Yeah, okay. If, how many of you know the name Ben Shapiro? Yeah, 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 okay. It's funny, the right side of the room raised more hands than the left side, and he's really right wing. This is funny. Um, it's from my perspective. So I'm not getting political here, but if you know anything of Ben Shapiro, he's, he's popular in the political fronts. He's extremely articulate. One of my sons thinks he should run for president someday. I'm not sharing anything political, but Ben Shapiro is is a Jew. He's Jewish. Now remember, we're talking about the language of the Egyptians and the learning of the Jews. Just coincidental, I was looking up something on, and, well, I was actually putting our videos up on, on YouTube for the class, and all of a sudden, I, this Ben Shapiro thing pops up, and I want to I play this for you. Um, maybe I don't have this all the way over yet. All right, so this is quick, and I, you're actually going to hear it twice. Ben Shapiro speaks so quickly that he can get an hour in in about a minute. And so the first video is really only going to take about 30 seconds. But um, now I've got to put this in context. He's speaking at a university, and he's being challenged by some people who are atheist or agnostic. All right? And his response is to them, and this is one of the people. Really matter. I mean, to, to my central argument, whether you're an agnostic or an atheist, the bottom line is that without the belief that there is a purpose to the universe, without a belief that there is a purpose to your life, without a belief that you have the capacity to make individual choices, it's very difficult to build a civilization. By difficult, I mean impossible. Okay. Uh, so on that uh, note of free will, which is what you're talking about, right? Yes. Uh, I think free will, by the way, is the single most important principle undergirding any civilization. Okay. Absolutely. And, and to be totally honest with you, I'm matter. I mean, to, to my central argument, whether you're an agnostic or an atheist. The bottom line is that without the belief that there is a purpose to the universe,
without a belief that there is a purpose to your life. Without a belief that you have the capacity to make individual choices. It's very difficult to build a civilization. By difficult, I mean impossible. Okay, uh, so on that um, note of free will, which is what you're talking about, right? Yes. Uh, I think free will, by the way, is the single most important principle undergirding any civilization. Okay, absolutely, and, and to be totally honest with you, I'm The last part is just some credits and disclaimers saying I'm, I'm really not saying Ben Shapiro believes any of this stuff. I go through a, a couple things that I thought summarized what I found fascinating that here's this very articulate Jewish man who will basically debate anybody in public because I have a feeling that they're still taught on these principles and uh, whether or not he's ever read the Book of Mormon, which I doubt, I don't, I don't have any evidence that he's ever read it or claims it. Everything that he said in this debate is exactly what Lehi taught his children. It's exactly what it is. So um, our, our challenge, so let's see, let me go back into our slideshow here. So the balance of life is in an opposition and we're, there's good on one side, there's, there's evil on the other. And God made us free in the middle. And so these things that are balanced, the justice of God, the mercy of God, everlasting death, everlasting life, punishment affixed, happiness affixed, man's infinite debt, God's infinite goodness, sin either remains with us forever or sin is forever removed. Justice claims us or mercy claims us. This is all what Lehi teaches his young children. This is why I say this is where pre-baptismal classes need to begin. So how do we tip the scales? How does this go one way or the other? The balance changes when our self-will changes, right? When our heart changes. That's, that's why Alma's great message, when he comes out of his coma in Mosiah 11, verse like 183, 185 in there, he says, be of good cheer because I've been what? I've been born again. I've been changed. And my heart wants something different than it did before when all I wanted to do was destroy the church. Now, I'm not saying your heart changes and all of a sudden the only thing you want to do is be a missionary. I'm just saying when your heart changes, that's the indication that God's spirit is, is already working within you. You know, whether someone's been balanced, baptized or not, that change begins when, when God's spirit in us be, begins to make us want something different. We, it's not something we can even do in ourselves. And when we do choose to make that covenant, he gives us a huge portion of his spirit to tip the scales forever in our favor um, if we allow this self-will to change. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. You know, this is why only the penitent are saved. The penitent simply meaning the ones whose hearts have changed. Because God said, I made this playing field. Now, life doesn't seem equal for all of us. Some people have more money. Some people have no money. Some people have you know, a nice car. Some people don't have a car. So, some people you know, just seem to have the, you know, the golden touch. Anything they do works. And some people, it's like they struggle their whole life. But yet, in our minds, God has made it equal because he said, I'm giving you the ability to choose righteous thoughts to guide your life in righteousness, no matter whether you live in poverty or wealth. And that's the only thing by which we're judged. That's why when we stand before God at that great and final day, I'm, he said, I'm no respecter of persons because it didn't matter where you lived or you know, how much was in the savings account 
or if you're a president, or if you're the pauper, this judgment we're based on is simply not that our works bring us salvation. The works are simply evidence that our heart changed. And this, this is what Lehi begins to teach. So this is a couple of the ways God gives you the advantage, despite the opposition. We're not left alone. He, he says this in Ether 5, I give you weakness that you will be humble, and we might be humbled physically, you know, we might have ailments, we might be humbled financially, we might be humbled with relationships, or we might be falsely accused. There's a lot of weakness, things that we'll experience in life. But God says, I allow those things. That's part of this opposition, why we shouldn't be caught off guard. He said, but anyone who humbles themselves before me, you know, one is saying, hey, there's going to be conditions that humble you. But anyone who chooses to humble, I'll make weak things become strong. See, that's not a favor God gives to the heathen or the, the unbelievers. King Benjamin states, I want you to remember that the blessed and happy state of all those who keep the commandments of God. Wherefore, they are blessed in all things, temporally, you know, this world, and spiritually. And John writes this so beautifully. Just remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? Our Savior has infinite power over Satan, although it seems like Satan wins from, from day to day. So, to whom will... This goes back to the same... Uh, the ch same chapters, Alma 8 and 9, where he's talking about how we're free. He states, Who doesn't harden his heart? To him is given a greater portion of the word, given unto him to know the mysteries of God until they know them in full. Now, chances are, if I surveyed the class, I could find that, like, like me, you've probably known some people who have maybe kind of been on track in their life, by on track meaning they, they want the good things. They've chosen with their free choice to choose the ways of God. And then suddenly something happens in their life, and usually it's not something God did. Usually it's something man does, or, or they get discouraged because of actions of people they see around them, maybe even in the church. And they get discouraged, and they don't want anything to do with it anymore. And they, they just they turn their back on it. And, and you've probably known one or two people like that. And then, so the scriptures talk about this, and it's interesting that I'm just going to skip down to, you know, verse, well, Alma, I'll read them both, I guess. Alma 14, 58. We can plainly discern that a people that have once been enlightened by the Spirit of God and hath great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness and then fall away into sin and transgression, they become more hardened than they, than they were before, right? Before they knew God. Isn't that something how that, that works? And he, and he writes of these dissenters of the Nephites who had been instructed in the knowledge of the Lord. But then he says, and he uses this term, he says, nevertheless, it's strange to relate. Not long after their dissensions, they became more hardened and impenitent and more wild, wicked, and ferocious than the Lamanites. You know, the Lamanites were the guys who, who were the poster children for being wicked and impenitent and ferocious. And now the, the Nephites were elbowing them out of the way. So... But we can't ever give up on them, and we can't ever give up on us to know that this full purpose of heart is really what repentance means. I think the word repentance has taken on connotations that miss the point. For we know not that they might return and repent and come to the Lord with full purpose of heart, that there's always a chance that our hearts can change, that our hearts can just simply say, Lord, I want you, I want your righteousness, I want your ways. That is what repentance fully means. So... Um, I'm going to skip over these guys right here. Again, these are just notes. Um, here's, well, I'm not going to skip over this too. I don't know. I think I have enough time to do this. If you, if you look online, you can see some of this derivation for this word um, uh, affixed. What I'd like to do, I've got a couple minutes. I'm going to try to jam this in there, even though it might not be smart. Um, there's some words in the, that describe Hebrew language. They sound almost like Dr. Seuss. It's like there's a nifel, there's a peel, there's a hiffle. There's, the, there's different types of word forms that we don't have. Let me give you an example that I think, and I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm just kind of have to tell you what I've read. There's different types of verb tenses and nouns and things. And nouns and verbs, there's some gray area in the Hebrew between them. Well, you can... You can do something in the past many times, or you can do something in the past once. Um, like if I say, I, I bought something at the store. 
Well, in the English, I could have bought something once or, you know, I, I, I bought a truck. Okay, I've only bought a truck once, but I, I bought groceries at Costco many times, and it's the same word to us. In the Hebrew, they would use a different word if you did it one time or if, or if you did it many times. And we don't differentiate that, but they do. They think differently. This word affix was interesting because this word affix in this hifil, if this was one of their types of verbs, meant to be stopped or to cause to be stopped. Well, what's interesting, oh, you know what, I, I probably got this out of order. Let me, let, me, let me jump ahead to this. If you cause something to happen in the, and it was something that was done in the past one time, they call it a hifil verb. Now, we don't have these in English. But so what do you do when you're translating from English? You have, or translating to English from Hebrew is what I meant to say. You have to come up with other words that sort of approximate and equate. Well, so if you did something in the past and it was a different word that you can't equate, what in English happens is you would have to add the words, it did cause something to happen. Now let me show you. Um, this is something I found in a little Hebrew primer thing where they're teaching how to use the language. And if you're an English reader, they give the English underneath. But this statement here, we caused to learn. We caused to learn. Now, if I go to the next one, notice this. They're translating this type of verb, something that happened in the past. She did cause to learn. He did cause to learn. That's how it would be properly said in English. Well, why do I share this? Well, the word did cause doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible because the Hebrew translate, I mean, I'm talking like King James, for instance, a couple hundred years ago and more. Did cause was something that you had to understand the nuance of the Hebrew, the, the language and everything, which, you know, some of these translators could pick out words, but they didn't live in the culture. They didn't understand it. But so this phrase, did cause, is what you have to say if you want to properly uh, describe the Hebrew equivalent of the understanding. It was bad English to Joseph. And again, but here I just made a list of some of these I found. Um, look at all these ones in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Gid Gadani did cause that they, God did cause a skin of something to happen, something that happened one time. The Lord did cause the serpents. Mosiah did cause his people. Shiblon did cause all. They did cause a great whatever. Um, they did cause the Lamanites. They did cause three divisions. That did cause, that just sounded like Joseph Smith, farm boy. That was, that was how you had to say it in Hebrew. Now, who would have known that? Who, who would know that? And that's like this primer example I, I give you. And then you could also use the word caused, and in our English equivalent, it sounds a little out of place. Now, this list is even longer, so it's very small, and I know you can't read it, but there's a hundred different ways that you can use this word caused incorrectly in English, but it's, and it's never done. I wouldn't say I, I, I caused that Mike should make me look like I'm in Star Wars here with all my gadgets on. You know, I, I could just say Mike did this, right? I wouldn't say you know, I didn't cause him to do it. Uh, he, I just asked him or he did it. Maybe that's not the greatest example. But we have other ways in English we would say these words, and we wouldn't say I caused that there should be. We would just say I did something, right? But you see hundreds of examples in the Book of Mormon on words that if... If you've got like one of the, like the 19, what was it, 66 edition or something where they kind of made a Reader's Digest version of the Book of Mormon, well, they thought what they were doing was improving Joseph Smith's lack of understanding of the English language. And all they did by creating that version was take out all the Hebrew authenticity of the words. I mean, you can still get the synopsis of the story, but when you have the, the RC is the best, I believe, that we have. Now, it goes back to the original manuscript and it's for clunky as the words sounded in there. It was, the right, it was the right way to properly translate Hebrew into English. So um, there's more of this. I've got tons of them. So anyhow, one last little thing, and then we'll get out of here. I can do this in, in a minute, maybe two. Jason's looking at me back there. So here's something I mentioned before, and I'll end here with this. word Joshua. Joshua sounds a little bit like the word Yeshua, which is what Hebrews call the Messiah. Well, this, this is something I photocopied out of a book online that's from 1871, after Joseph Smith as well. But what they go through is they show Joshua had a different verb form, and they said this word Joshua, it was spelled differently because Joshua caused, he was caused to be victorious. Remember that Hebrew, he caused to be, right? So 
the name was originally, and I can't say it in Hebrew, but it's, it's some Yeshua, sort of. But Moses changed it, and he had this niffle, hiffle, whatever. Like I said, there's some Dr. Seuss kind of descriptions. They're all part of Hebrew speech. To change his name, because they were victorious, his name that sounded more like Yeshua became Joshua, because that's how you said he caused them to be victorious. He caused Judah to be victorious. So Joshua's name was respelled to reflect the victory that he caused by delivering the people, right? Well, so I share this because in uh, Jeff Benner, who's this Hebrew author, he writes about this word, and I'm, I'm just going to have to show you here. He writes about this word Savior, and he said this word Savior was uh, actually written as if you wrote it to cause to deliver, meaning delivering, I throw this out because this King Mosiah, who was made king over the land of Zarahemla, what did he do? He warned his people to flee out of the land of Nephi. He saved all the Nephites, although the story is only told in a verse. He delivered all of them to freedom by getting them away from the Nephites who were about to kill him. He warned them to flee. As many would hearken to the voice of the Lord, they departed in the wilderness. So Mosiah caused them to be delivered. Well, when you look in the Hebrew, this word Moshi was this deliverer. And if you change it, it means to cause to be delivered. And when you change it to be caused to delivered, Moshiach becomes this, well, it's down here on the bottom of the slide. Um, it's Moshiach, which is our book, Mosiah. And, and so I know there's a lot of information there. And because we're short on time, I'm, I'm going to end abruptly. But um, if, you if you want to, you can go to search Restore Gospel Podcast online. You can find the YouTube series that we've got all these things on, or you can go to restoredgospel.com and you can find all these notes there. So thank you.